Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another fabulous event that Libraries of Tasmania is running for National Family History Month. Uh, today, we are very lucky to have one of our um, archivists, Jen Jerome, talking about the Commonplace book and some of them that are in our collection. Um, I'd like to yeah, offer a warm welcome to you all. And bef before we um, begin, can I just check that everyone has their phones on silent, please? Thank you very much. And I'd also like to offer an acknowledgement of Tasmania towards um, Tasmania's Aboriginal peoples. We recognise the deep histories and cultures of the Aboriginal people of Lutruwita, Tasmania. We acknowledge Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional and continuing custodians of the lands, waters and sky. We pay respects to elders past and present who hold the memories, traditions, culture and knowledge of country. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose countries were never ceded. So today's talk is called A Curious Mixture about commonplace books in the Tasmanian archives and State Library. There will be a Q&A at the end, but uh, we'll welcome Jen to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, yep, so I'm Jen Jerome, I'm one of the archivists um, who work for the State Library and Tasmanian Archives. And um, the area that I work in in particular is the community archives. Uh, and that's mainly archives that are created um, by members of the public as opposed to government records. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about one of my favourite topics, <laughs> which is commonplace books. Um, and we've got quite a few, well, we have about 20, 25 commonplace books in our collections um, and I've, given, I've got a list which um, for those people who are listening um, online um, can be emailed um, and if you're in the audience I've got a handout for you to, to see if you wanted to follow up and order any of them. Only about two or three have been digitised, you can look at those online. The other items you need to come in and look at them and if you particularly like one you can always put a request in that we get it digitised if you're inspired by what you see up here. <laughs> so um, so what are they? Um, they're very personal, eclectic um, albums, um, usually, and they include handwriting, quirky and unexpected inclusions, alongside well-known phrases, hints and tips. Now, this particular talk was initially inspired, I mean, commonplace books, if you're an archivist or a librarian, are usually something that um, you're sort of aware of, and when they come in, you, you have a little smile, have a look through them. So I knew of them, but then we had one that came in through the um, the, the return shoot at the Hobart Library, and um, which is a bit unusual. We don't tend to get our donations through the um, Hobart Library return shoot. And the staff who found it were quite curious and they were like, what is this? And um, and where has it come from? And this was this is the item here. I'll just click. Yeah. Um, and for those of you physically here, um, I have it here and you're very welcome to have a look at it um, at the end of the talk. So, um, so being a non-published item, I was lucky enough for it to come into um, my custody. And my first concern was ownership. Someone's dropped it in, but did they even own it to be able to give it to us? So that was what I had to work out. And I started my investigation by looking through the volume. And luckily it had an inscription at the front, which gave a few names for the family. Um, and it said that this was a Miss Mary Wharton and had been added to saying that Mary was the mother of Charles Henry V Marsh and the book was presented to Barry from Ruth Marsh, daughter of Charles. So that was brilliant. Like that gave me quite a big start. Um, then, so then I was able to find out, did a bit of investigating about Mary. And she was English and she migrated to Tasmania with her parents, James and Hannah in the 1840s. And her parents, I couldn't find too much about her parents, but they seemed to be um, educators of some sort. They ran a school in Sandy Bay and James uh, played the cello, and so he played in various um, ensembles around Hobart. Now, the entries by Mary are mostly dated 1851. So using this date, I was able to narrow down a little bit more, and I was able to find that there were some names in the book that were also dated um, 1851. 
um, and I could find a ship, I found a ship that came into Hobart with this particular set of people on it. So whether Mary knew them before or not, I don't know, but they were on the ship and they um, came in and then um, they signed her book for her with um, some little sayings and, and little um, um, sort of nice little sayings in there. And they're all around about the same time. So I was able to find that. Um, and they're also quite, Mary was involved, as most of the colonial um, Tasmanians were, she was involved with the church, the local church, and so these people were also part of the church group, so there was a connection there which could be delved into a bit further. Um, so. Okay. So what I was able to find was that Mary married Henry James Marsh, an ironmonger, in 1852. Um, so, but she died just a year later of scarlet fever and complications from childbirth. But her son Charles survived and went on to become an ironmonger like his father. And I was able to find that Charles married twice and um, he had at least five children. And there were entries, other entries in the book, which um, because of their later dates in like the 1870s and 1880s, they must have been from this later members of the family. Um, and one of Charles and uh, Mary White's children was Ruth Marsh. So this made sense here. Um, so now I found Ruth Marsh, but I couldn't find a connection to a Barry. There just wasn't anything that I could find. So um, my colleagues in the marketing area um, put out a call on social media to say, look, this has been dropped in the return sheet. Does anyone know? Is it Does it belong to anybody? Um, we'd love to find some information and some authority about that. Um, and the I was, I was a little bit sceptical. I thought, who's going to listen to that? <laughs> but amazingly, the donor came forward. Um, and also some members of the Wharton family who were travelling in Europe at the time somehow managed to hear my radio interview, <laughs> so I don't know quite how that works, um, and they also got in contact. So when they're back from their trip to Europe, they're going to see whether they can donate some photographs to us, which is fantastic. They thought they'd had a photo of Mary, but given that she died in 1853, the likelihood of having a photo of her is quite slim. So maybe a sketch or something like that if we're lucky. Um, so the anonymous donor came forward. She wants to remain anonymous. It, she's not actually part of the family. Um, the volume came into her custody, um, but when the house that um, Barry was living in, when Barry passed away and his house was sold, then the book was um, left in the house and it was um, then sort of taken by um, someone after that. And then she was a librarian and so it got into her custody. Um, and But she was able to tell me that Barry was the musician Barry de Jersey and he was born in 1936. He was an Australian pianist, composer and teacher who studied at the Conservatorium High School in Hobart, the University of Tasmania, and he went on to study at Salzburg. Um, when he returned to Hobart, he was one of the founding members of the music department at the University of Tasmania, and he died in 2007. So this was very, very helpful. Um, it was able to give me uh, a way of going back in the family tree over here. Um, and then I was able to make a link between Jessie White and Mary White, um, that they were sisters, and this is how <laughs> it had come through. So it was a lovely um, um, eureka moment to find how it had all come through. So, um, so Barry passed away, the book was found in the house, and then 24 years later it pops into the Hobart shoot. So... Um, so now let's have a look at some commonplace books. Okay, so what is a commonplace book? Um, there's, in simple terms, one way of looking at it is that it's a commonplace for gathering snippets of information. So the bits of information themselves don't have to have any relation to each other, except their connection is that the owner of the book has chosen for them to go into, into the volume. Um, Traditionally, the information is in the form of transcribed text. So they may follow a formula, however, they always end up being, to a certain extent, personal and unique. 
So they can be quite useful to finding what's interesting, important, or worth, what someone thought was interesting, important, or worth remembering. So you can enter into someone's uh, way of thinking. Um, they can also be records of what certain societies and cultural groups felt was worth noting and studying. So if you look at a few commonplace books of a particular group of people, you can see what they valued at a time. Um, the term commonplace also refers to the use of books to rec record common or universally used phrases or instructions. This is the, uh, the older version of commonplace as opposed to bland and boring, um, but it's actually just a, a common usage. So they've been used for thousands of years and they were very useful at a time before publications were easily accessible. So you can imagine if you didn't have your own library, you could put the important parts of, um, of script into your commonplace book to refer to. Um, and even if you did have a larger library, rather than having to go through everything to find the, the important things you're after, you could put them in your one or many commonplace books. And they're also a way to organise information. Um, they were very popular among scholars, um, where scholarship required a knowledge of a broad range of subjects and texts. So you could quickly look things up, and they were a very important way of memory creation for people. Um, so by writing it down, there's a lot of there was a lot of thought and um, conjecture that by physically writing something down, it aided your memory to remember something. Um, so, but the process of creating and utilising a commonplace book wasn't just to assist or recall, it was also to mix and match information. So through serendipity, you'd find in your commonplace book two concepts next to each other, um, and this encouraged scholars and writers to find um, links between what they may have thought was unrelated pieces of information, and so it sparked creativity and new thought. Um, <clears throat> before the introduction of said anthologies, scholars encouraged and taught methods for creating commonplace books. Uh, it was actually seen to be an indication of a learned person, to have someone who was serious and dedicated in their approach to their studies, that they would spend the time putting together a commonplace book. So commonplace books, like I've said, they're interesting places to see how an author in particular has developed their ideas. So. Because of this, it's not too surprising that some of the commonplace books that um, famous authors created have actually now been transcribed and turned into published books. And you can find some of those, Robert Burns, George Eliot, John Milton, um, all of these um, authors, you will find their commonplace books available for you to um, um, go to the library and have a look at them. One person who kept a commonplace book um, well, apparently, we don't have a copy of it, was William Shakespeare. Um, and you can see that the works of Shakespeare benefit from his broad knowledge of classical texts, politics, myths, sayings, and general facts, and his ability to compare and analyse information. So as Walter Ong wrote, the reason Shakespeare is so quotable is that his text consists so much of quotations, not grossly appropriated, but nuanced, woven into the texture of his work. Um, so with the popularity of commonplace books also came some criticism. So many people's books contained similar, popular, better known passages of text. And as you can imagine, while Shakespeare was able to, you know, pull this together and come out with something absolutely beautiful and unique at the end, um, not everybody could do that. <laughs> it was quite so schooled. And there was not a direct correlation between having quotes in a book and actually having read them and understood them. So. Um, that's what we have I put up here, um, just this little quote, their brains lie all in notes, Lord, um, how they'd look if they should chance to lose their table book. And that's 1638, but the table book being a commonplace book. So basically, you've got it there, but um, <laughs> you haven't actually absorbed any of it. So there are a range of books that can be termed commonplace books, and there are a variety of terms for other collections of handwritten, published and ephemeral items. So I've included some of those around here, and I'm just going to step through because I think it's oh, I think it's quite interesting, and you can see the different types of things. And then you'll have a chance to think to yourselves as to whether what you would term as a commonplace book, or whether you think some of these things actually fit in the category or not as a commonplace book, and whether the two that I've brought in today, whether you think they are commonplace books at all. So the first one that I'm going to look at, and excuse my pronunciation if I get some of these wrong, uh, Florilegium. There we go. 
Uh, and that would be the one with the flowers on the um, on the side there would be what you would think of when you're thinking of that. But basically, um, floral atrium referred to a gathering of flowers, but in their earliest form, it was not a gathering of actual literal flowers. It was a gathering of um, items such as pearls of wisdom. So it was a bringing together of inf information. But most commonly today, it's used for botanical illustrations with um, Banks Florilegium being perhaps the most famous that you probably all would have heard of. Uh, and if you Google Florilegium, that's what you're going to get. Um, and I've chose, put on the side here to give you an example of the earlier ones. Um, this is from 1306, um, and it was by Thomas of Ireland, and its collection includes authoritative quotations, and he's ordered them alphabetically under topics. Um, and his work was quite popular, and it was reprinted and used extensively. So we've got um, album um, amicorums, which are otherwise known as friendship albums. These include entries by the friends of the owner. Um, they can be drawings, paintings, favourite passages of text, messages of farewell or good luck. Um, and now you can find these mainly back to the 1500s, and they were particularly popular with um, younger, wealthy people who were travelling for their studies. And they would take their book with them, and then the friends that they met, they'd get them to um, add things into their book and sign them. Um, and the wealthier you were, <laughs> the more fancy you could get. So you could actually commission someone to paint something, which then you would give to your friend and sign your name to. So you, most of them are not actually done by the person themselves. They are um, just something where a local artist, that would have been what they would have, how they would have made their money. So the pictures on this slide show an album owned by German student Moses Walders in the early 17th century, um, and that's kept by the British Library, and he'd created it during a trip to Italy. And the pictures on the next slide. Um, and I do encourage you to look at some of these online. They're really quite amazing, some of the details. I just had to pick out some that I thought might catch your eye a bit more, but there's some absolutely gorgeous pictures. Um, so this is by Jacob um, Helbloch, and his album is in the National Library of Netherlands, and he started his book in 1645. Unlike other travellers, he actually kept doing his book through his whole life. He, he had a sense of that he was an important chap, and so he wanted to make sure his life was recorded. So then we have one of my personal favourites, autograph books. Um, these are pared down versions of friendship albums and they tend to include text with small illustrations and they can be very useful sources for tracing the social life of an individual. Um, however, the entries added by friends and acquaintances and tend to be sort of quite sort of uh, jokey or sentimental. So you can't quite get a feeling of the, of the individual themselves necessarily. So this slide shows two pages from autograph, autograph books from a collection of from Auckland libraries. One page is from the autograph book of Alice Gill, and Gill's um, book is filled with ink blot drawings of pigs, accompanying friends' signatures and dates, which is a really interesting way to come at it. There's a bit of debate as to whether they're pigs or sheep, but um, <laughs> the book is just filled with all of those. It's quite lovely. Um, and then you've got another example with a pig on it, <laughs> which was from Joan Pitcher's album, um, and that entry is dated 1939. Um, and then you've got a World War One autograph book belonging to Albert George Nolan Winkworth, which I've included a few pages of that as well. And just to, this is actually in our collection, and I believe, I think it's been digitised. I'll have to double check on that. Um, but this one is from the Pierce family. Um, so the autograph book of Elaine Pierce covers 1933 to 1953, but there's also a late edition. So she obviously kept it and it was important to her. And this one on the side, so her friend Betty Venus wrote a little note to her in 1935. And then um, Betty's um, 80th birthday notice from the newspaper, she's got that cut it out, put it next to um, Betty's entry. So that's quite lovely. So Elaine was born in Launceston in 1917. She attended the Friends School before moving to Victoria for six years. Uh, she was a Lance Corporal in World War II and she trained as an occupational therapist after the war and she died in 2012. 
Uh, so here we have recipe books. So recipes in the context of commonplace books is not just talking about food. It's um, also for making items like cleaners, inks, and polishes. The ingredients and methods are handwritten, and oftentimes you, you can see throughout a book, different hands have written the recipes in there because it's been handed through family. Um, they're also well thumbed with splashes and smudges showing that they've been used. So you can see um, on this slide some examples, um, how to make red wax, preserving flowers, cleaning a stove, and making ginger pudding. So some quite random, um, but all um, very, very common to find in a common place book. So the next one I'm looking at is scrapbooks. And there's some de debate as to whether a scrapbook is actually a commonplace book. Um, now, as I mentioned before, many people see the importance of a commonplace book is your actual handwriting. So you're seeing something, you're writing it yourself, and the handwriting in some of the early commonplace books is absolutely beautiful. So they'd really slow down and took their time to write that. Um, so where there's a scrapbook with no annotations, uh, this one has a few that I've got up there, but with none, um, people would often say that it's not a commonplace book, it's just a scrapbook. Um, a traditional view of a commonplace book is it's not simply a place to find items of future reference, but it's a tool for building knowledge. So the knowledge has to be absorbed and be able to be referenced for the future. Um, now, one interesting thing of that is that that would also probably put friendship albums and autograph books out of <laughs> the classification of commonplace books. So that's what I mean. You have to make up your own mind as to where you think they quite fit. Um, we do. We don't tend to acquire scrapbooks at the State Library and Archives. Um, however, having said that, because a lot of the things you can find on Trove and you can find in other places, but um, we do have some exceptions. So, and we do this if there's a lot of annotations or if somebody has, um, for instance, the Asthma Foundation have put together all of the articles related to the development of the Asthma Foundation in one place. Um, we have something, the conductor, um, Stuart Challenger, he gave us a few clipping um, books and it follows his career and not just Australian papers um, all around the world as well. And we have the Contemporary Aboriginal Issues Groups um, scraps on um, newspaper clippings on Aboriginal Tasmanian rights. So to have all of those in one place can be quite useful. So commonplace books can contain elements similar to journals or diaries, um, but and they can have um, notes of thoughts and ideas as well as dates to remember and descriptions of events and activities. However, they're not journals in the sense that they the contents is usually not authored by the person who creates the items. So that's the big difference between a journal and a commonplace book. So just to give you a bit of an idea of the history of commonplace books, I just thought I'd show you some really fantastic um, older ones. Um, they're obviously, well, they're not held by our institution, unfortunately. Um, the first example is uh, this one here written by William Hill. And he wrote it, him and his family wrote it between 1560 and 1625, and it's held at Yale University. Um, includes information that might be needed for undertaking tasks, as well as short tracts of religious and popular texts. And the back of the volume contains genealogical information from the Hill family. So it was very much a source of information um, carried through this family. Uh, you can see it's um, well. It's, it's amazing that it survived this long, but it's um, it's well used. So some of the information. This is just a few pages that I've picked out of his book. Um, so quick reference information includes um, recipes for making ink, red wax, white letters on black paper, arithmetic tables, measurements, and conversions for dry goods, as well as salmon, eels, wine, and oil. But most of the book is used for to record hundreds of Latin and English proverbs. The next example is another hill. This is Richard Hill, and he was a, um, a servant and later a grocer. And he um, was born about 1490, and he um, created this book between 1503 and 1536. And this is kept at Oxford University. 
Um, so the translated title of his book, which is written on the front, was is a book of diverse tales and ballads and diverse bills or accounts. So he used his book to record lyrics from songs as well as descriptions of commercial life in Tudor England. So this is a particularly great example for people who are wanting to know what it was like at the time. He included treaties on polite behaviour and arithmetic, notes on his family, collected proverbs, literature, riddles, chronicles, and a French conversation manual. Um, some of the more diverse items include um, instructions on how to break a horse, how to conjure with cards, and how to make rat poison. Um, this one is a great one if you want to do some more research and learn a bit about commonplace books because it's actually been a full trans transcription of the book was made in 1920. So you can go into the University of um, Oxford's website and actually have a good old look through that one. So now I'll just jump to our commonplace books. Okay, so... We've got, I think it's quite, we've got a small but significant collection of commonplace books. Um, and I've brought a few examples, like I said, here. Um, and I've got, like I said, there's a, a, a list that people can have a look at and order to have a look at in the history or contact me and I can try and get some of them digitised if you can't come in. So this one is the commonplace or scrapbook of the Miller family. Um, it's called the commonplace of the Miller family. Um, although, it, and it contains all the classic elements of a commonplace, along with aspects of a scrapbook. The Cox family donated it to the Tasmanian archives, along with papers and genealogical information. Unfortunately, though, and why so it's called the, co the commonplace book of the Miller family, not much has actually been done um, to research those papers of those families. So more information, if any of you are keen, you need, that needs to be got into, delve through a little bit to work out exactly who are who possibly could have created this. And it definitely goes through different hands as well. So the volume has a heavy focus on pictures of well-known people, particularly clergy, writers and politicians. So to my mind, it looks like someone started doing the book and they did these pastes and then a little paragraph on each of the people. Um, and then they put the book down and then someone else picked the book up and started to use it to put in bits of newspaper. For example, this Christmas Games for Juveniles. Um, and then there's handwritten recipes, as, as well as methods to preserve flowers, to crochet, to make waterproof cloth, cure chapped hands. Um, so my, that's why I'm sort of thinking it, it's been used by various people. There's also some really interesting things. These little um, stickers have all been, well, I'm not entirely sure what they are actually. They look like the little emblems that you might get on the back of an envelope. So it's like someone's had the envelope and there's a little embossed portion and they've cut that out and popped them in the book. But there's so many of them. <laughs> and I did ask my learned colleagues and nobody, they gave me a few exam, um, suggestions, but no one could say exactly what they were. So um, perhaps someone listening to this talk might go, oh, I know what they are. Um, and they're, they're really quite gorgeous. And I've just put on the bottom there, there's a really cute hand-drawn picture of a rat and a <laughs> hand-coloured picture of a lady with a basket on her head. They're just, they're quite charming, but I, I'm not quite sure what they are. Um, so, sorry, I lost my spot then. Um, and then there's also this interesting inclusion of an illustration of five members of the Baptist Missionary Society. Um, and they're actually, it's, so it's, it's been signed. So either this person got them to sign it or they got it from somewhere and stuck it in their book. But if it is actually um, was put in at the time, then this would date at about 1800. Okay, there's also other items in the book which show it to be used in 1900 um, and also there's the last clipping in it is dated April 1940. So it was used over quite a long period of time. Then we have the Lewis Commonplace book. So Thomas Lewis was born in Hobart in 1825. He was one of 11 children of Richard Lewis who was a merchant government appraiser and one of the founding proprietors of the Bank of Van Diemen's Land. And it looks like Thomas followed his father into the role of a merchant um, and was part of, he was a senior partner of the firm R. Lewis and Sons. So the, while the book includes elements of a commonplace, it's, to my mind, it's a, it's a bit of a hybrid. Um, most of the book includes commonplace elements. It's got writings, quotes, information and cuttings, but a large section is devoted to the pricing of clothing and haberdashery. So I think that he sort of stopped using it for one purpose and then continued to use it for the other or vice versa. 
Um, although I do feel that, and there's, it's interesting, sometimes we can be time strapped, um, it's time poor as archivists and we get something and we think we know what it is and we've got a short time to describe it and we describe it and pop it in. And then someone will come back and look at it later and go, I think that's what it is and all. And in this case, you were kind of slightly confused by the front. It says Thomas Lewis's letter book. So you think, oh, it's a letter book. Um, there's only four letters in the whole book and they are on this page here. And I think they might be pretend letters because they are all dated around about the same time, 1844. And it's him apologising for being late to an appointment. Each letter gets more and more feverish, like, I'm really sorry that I couldn't come yesterday or come tomorrow. Oh, I'm really sorry I couldn't come today, you know, and the day before. And so it's either a, a letter writing exercise um, or, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure. But it's, it's, it's and I thought, oh, it's a, it's a child doing it. When I found out that he would have been about 25 at the time, I thought, well, that's a bit juvenile humour for a 25 year old. But um, anyway, so the image that we've got here, we're very lucky that the um, the Lewis family donated um, a large amount of um, portraits of the family because it was quite a, a wealthy family at the time. And Thomas Bock, um, who was a portrait painter in Hobart in the 1840s, he was actually commissioned to make portraits of the family, um, which are part of the Allport Library Museum of Fine Arts, and they can be viewed online. So that's is it just wonderful in this example to be able to say, this is the person who owned the book. Other interesting um, items that we have on here, um, there's something about preserving shingles and weatherboards, um, an explanation of what piles are and their treatment, and a little section on etiquette advice. Um, so there's a, an interesting thing about marriage there, that you're not to contact someone once you've got married and you, you know, you've got to make it very clear that you give them a card if they're allowed to contact you and if not, no contact, no further intercourse is desired. Um, so there's some, yeah, some quite interesting little advices. Uh, and when I looked into where they came from, because they didn't say the source, they are very likely to have come from an 1834 um, book on, uh, was it eti hints on etiquette and the usage of society with a glance at bad habits by Charles Day. And it was printed, like I said, originally in 1834, and then it was rapidly reprinted. So I think everybody wanted to know how to deport themselves properly. And then um, it was even published in Hobart in 1838. We've got two copies of that in the State Library's collection. So as far as I could find, um, Thomas never married. Instead, he travelled to Melbourne and Auckland. Um, and lived in Gippsland and the Goulburn areas of New South Wales, and he died in Hobart in 1898. And we have the Roberts Commonplace book. <clears throat> this belonged to Henry Llewellyn Roberts, and it came to a, with, a, with a large set of papers from the family. Henry was born in Hobart in 1831, and he travelled in 1854 to the Victorian gold diggings. Um, his book is very interesting in that there's indications that he was a singer. His book contains songs and notes on ways to deal with hoarseness and improving the voice. And he's got an example of a book, which is a transcript of the Ivy Green by Charles Dickens, um, which was a poem included in the Pickwick Papers published in 1836. And there was a score created for that in 1838 and widely published by 1845. So it very much fits that it would have been in circulation around that time. So you likely have heard of the Roberts family. Um, they have played a significant role in Hobart um, with Roberts and Co. And Henry and his wife, Mary, built a substantial home, Beau Morris, um, fronting Sandy Bay Road and extending to Newcastle Street Battery Point. And Mary established the original Beau Morris Zoo at the site. So that it actually got moved later on to another site. Um, but they, she established the original. She's uh, quite an interesting person within the set of books about the Roberts family. And Henry died in 1919 and Mary passed away two years later. So, just a couple of other things for... Um, he also included in his book Sir Henry Halford's Recipe for Nervous People. Um, I thought this was quite good. It recommends, um, when needed, a tablespoonful of a mixture of camphor, camphor duple, peppermint, spirit of ammonia, and syrup of saffron be taken. Um, and again, you're able to sort of like put the time and the date around that. And this was actually um, 
uh, remedy recommended by Sir Henry Halford, who was president of the Royal College of Physicians um, until he died in 1844. So another item of note is instructions for the process of mesmerism. Um, which uh, would have been a, a book by Thomas Pine in 1844, and little snippets of that were reproduced in newspapers at the time as a popular um, concept. Um, at the end of the used portion of the book, I thought this was quite interesting. There are two sections, and you can see the handwriting has deteriorated significantly over here, and that would make sense um, as Henry was getting um, a lot older at that time. He may not have had the same manual dexterity. But I think they were still written by him because they're related to music. So he's put two um, pieces of music, um, roughly dated 1896 and 1907, um, and I was able to find the publications that they came from. One was an 1895 publication, A Vagabond in Spain, um, and the other one was a 1907 poem um, which was actually um, from a poem. It's a poem of an epitaph, epitaph written to be placed in a cemetery for dogs and horses. And the other poem is, um, which I've put down, it's like, uh, now the night is closing round me and the death winds chilly and wild proclaim the end of the journey and laugh at the dreams of the child. Um, and I mentioned that in particular because that's very common in these things. Um, the And when you think about the ways you could die, then, you know, death was always close around you um, and the Victorians were um, fond of their um, melancholy um, sayings and um, prose, so that's, that's um, quite common. <clears throat> Next one is the commonplace book of William Ambrose Dawson. Um, and... So this is from a set of diaries and notebooks by Dawson. He was born in 1853 in Hobart to a shipwright, William Dawson, and his wife, Louisa Wilson. He was one of six children, and he died in 1922. So William's records were given to William Crowther in 1930 by Dawson's sister. Um, now, they probably languished a little bit on the shelf because his interests were shipping local politics, Tasmanian lodges and religious activities, which have perhaps gone out of vogue, um, but may pop back again. So the commonplace book covers 1869 to 1887, and so many, meant he would have kept the book from age 16 to 34. Um, he was employed as a clerk, and his book reflects this interest with a section on questions and answers relative to bookkeeping. Um, I don't think that William married. I couldn't find any indication of that. Um, but his book does have a little note about married life. Um, so I don't. I think that's perhaps a warning off. He he didn't like the sounds of that, and so he didn't want to follow that through. Um, it includes transcribed poetry as well as original poetry written by William. Um, and most of the poems in there seem to have been, and I found this as a, a reoccurring theme across the commonplace books, that there were lots of church publications that included poetry in them, and then people have taken those poems and then they transcribed them. So a lot of the, the poems, when you find the original sources, they are from religious um, publications. And obviously you've got a lovely little um, sketch down the bottom. There's a few sketches in there as well. And some more of the sticking in of um, little um, stamps in there as well. Um, other elements include the transcribed stories of St Luke, a history of Chichester Cathedral. Um, and later in the book, the text becomes more varied with items like riddles and recipes and pasted published items. And it's, it's nice, you get a bit of a sense of who he was as a person. There's inclusions um, of a published item, the golden rule for avoiding sin, and he tried to do his duty. Um, but, of course, as most commonplace books do, he's also got at least one remedy. He's got a cure for warts in there as well. <clears throat> so this is a quite a slim volume that we have. It's the commonplace book of Margaret um, Claiborne. Um, now, we're able to say exactly who it is because she put a name in the front and she signed it and dated it. Um, so, Mount Direction, August the 7th, 1867. So, so, Margaret Sarah was born in 1826. She was one of 10 children of the Irish settler Richard Claiborne and Margaret McGill. Uh, Richard was a merchant. He had a wide range of business dealings, including operating the Risden Ferry. It was also an MLC for Hewan. Um, but what I found is that, I mean, there were 
I can't remember, 10 children, but uh, Margaret Seary didn't marry and um, she died at Mount Direction, Risdon in 1885. So in her book, she, transcri she focused on transcribing poetry. And so you can see here, um, there's a Christian un union poem that she's put. I mean, I'm, my, probably my knowledge of English literature not being as great as it could be. I was just curious. I read this poem and I'm like, oh, this was written in um, like the 1840s, did I say? Um, and, um, oh, no, so, yeah, this was written in 1860 and it's very, very similar to Kipling's poem If, which was written in 1895. So it's just when you looking at um, the inspirations for authors and writers, it's useful to better go back and think, oh, Kipling was one fantastic, but, oh, maybe he was inspired by something that came a few years later. Maybe he wasn't quite the um, original thinker that um, that we thought. Not that the poem isn't great. Um, and there's also in notations, some modern notations in the book, about um, the go right up to the 1970s. Now, Margaret is listed in the Claiborne family history um, as a painter, and she's said to have created a number of paintings. Um, we have a collection of papers from the family, and I, I just thought I'd put, pop that in there, but there's a watercolour, and it's quite likely that that's actually by her. Not sure, but um, possible. And we also have photographs of Margaret. Well, we have photographs from the family papers, none of which have any kind of annotation on the back saying who's who. Um, so she could be, these are my three most likely candidates of who she could possibly be. I could be completely off the mark, but um, that's the three. So if you do have family photos at home, please write on the back of them before you donate them to us. So now we have the commonplace book of Thomas Reedy. And um, Thomas Reedy was born in 1828. He was married twice to Caroline in 1856. And when she died in 1863, he married Margaret Bennett in 1870. They lived at Bertram's, a property on Fitzroy Crescent. And Thomas was for many years the governor of the prison for males, um, which was located just down the road here at Campbell Street. Thomas became unwell in his late 40s and he died aged 52 in 1880. Now, this is an, um, an, a sort of slightly puzzling um, edition, even though we've called it the commonplace book of Thomas Reedy. Um, I suspect that Thomas wasn't actually the author, um, that it may have been his property. However, the dates of the item go well beyond the dates of his death. Um, and there's also references very early in the volume to Papa and to Thomas, which make it sound like it's written um, about him rather than by him. Um, but you can find that the commonplace book was originally created in 1852 to record stores of division um, number 10 at the prison. So it probably was, you know, a book that was used for something and then the family had it after their father passed away. And so in the 1910s, someone got very busy putting um, recipes in, but there's a recipe for pudding, self-raising flour, brown cake, coffee rolls and preserved haddock, which... It could be that someone in the family, well, uh, definitely not Thomas anyway, so someone else later on got into that and a very different style of handwriting as well. Um, there's also some pasted some um, autographs throughout the collection. There's an original Marcus Clark autograph, a John, John Franklin, and several of the Irish exiles, and also a lot that's been cut out and um, hopefully not by anyone here. <laughs> but um, before we got the item, I should think that a lot of these signatures, which would be worth a bit of money, were sold on. And we have um, Rita Jessie Percy. Um, this one came to us from uh, South Australia. And this was, I got a con call one day saying, we've got this item and we think it might actually be to do with Tasmania and not to do with South Australia. So I did a bit of investigation and um, found that, yes, it was brought to South Australia through the Finnis family because um, it was in the possession of Canon Horace Percy Finnis. And um, Horace was the nephew of the book's author, Rita Jessie Percy. So Rita was of the Percy family of Clarence Plains, uh, and they arrived in Tasmania on the ship The Superb in 1874. So her parents, Frederick and Eliza, arrived with their six children, including Rita Jessie, and they owned the land that later became the Hobart suburb of Tranmere. So Rita's sister, Augusta, married the Reverend Her um, Herbert Robert Finnis, uh, and their son was Horace Percy Finnis, and then he ended up going to South Australia, so the book went with him. 
Um, her book is quite lovely. It includes illustrations, recipes, transcripts of poetry and other writing exercises. This sh slide shows an example of um, an animal alphabet that she'd written out, um, a set of sayings and their Spanish translations, um, and a recipe for creating Miss Kemp's salve for boils, sores and corns. So there's a large section in the book included a journal, Letters from Scottsdale, April 1876. Um, and I do recommend having a look, coming to the history and having a look at this one. It's quite a nice little read. Um, so she would have been about 25 and it describes travelling by horse-drawn coach from Hobart to Launceston and then on to Scottsdale. And she's got some really cute little sketches that she's included in there. Um, and then she's also got in her an account, because I'm opening the page I'm like, oh, there's feathers in here. And it's right next to her account of having a meal of curried magpie. So <laughs> I thought that was quite great. She wanted to, yep, she really did do it. And so she stuck that. I mean, we haven't done DNA testing on them, but there's a bit of a um, uncurried magpie. Um, so she lived her whole life in Clarence Plains and she died at Bayview Rokeby in September 1917. Now, this is a commonplace book that you can find online. Uh, it's been digitised. It's Henrietta Maria Garrett's commonplace book. And um, Henrietta was born in 1824 to Robert Garrett and Martha Charlotte Bowden, Bowen, rather, sorry, of Hobart Town. Her father was the assistant colonial surgeon of Van Diemen's Land, and her mother was the daughter of Lieutenant John Bowen. So the volume... Uh, Henrietta used this, um, so it's similar to the one that um, we got through the return sheet. So she would have bought this lovely item, um, you can see on the, the side there, from a stationer. Um, it would have cost a reasonable amount of money, I should think, and it's um, embossed and it's got some pages that are just ready for her to be using for this purpose. Uh, so, it, yeah, it's a very high quality. Um, the book originally contained this watercolour, slip through. Oh, yeah, down here, um, and but it was removed at some point um, before it came into our custody uh, and it now is in the National Gallery of Australia. It's a Thomas Wainwright portrait, so you can understand why the National Gallery of Australia would want to have that, but it also shows you the level um, in society of this particular family that they would have had someone um, create something like that. Um, so Henrietta maintained this book from age 12 until she was 48, so during over those years, she was a young woman and she married Samuel Robertson Dawson. She had six children and she moved to Victoria and she passed away in 1883, age 58. So her book includes several elements that are typical of this kind, like I've said before, poetry quotes, prose related to the topics of love, marriage, farewell and death, um, autographs and notes from friends. Um, and you can see on the... Um, just on the green paper there, um, she's written a little poem in the memory of her son, William, um, who died aged six in 1873. So, and one of my colleagues did some investigation on this um, piece, um, and it's quite a lovely um, little addition into the book. It's the um, ladder of matrimony, which leads us through the potential stages of courtship and marriage recorded up and down the rungs of a ladder. So underneath the ladder, a poem which was created by her friend LJ is inscribed and dated 1871. And the depictions of matrimonial ladders that were used throughout the 19th century, they became popular um, because William Hone in 1820 wrote a poem, The Queen's Matrimonial Ladder, which was a satirical, satirical look at the relationship between Great Britain's Queen Caroline and George the, King George IV. And I'll attribute that to um, my colleague, Tara, who did, um, is one of our catalogues who did some quite good inf um, investigation into that, but it's, it's a lovely little read. And like I said, this has been digitised, so you can look at it online. So I'll just finish up by showing you what is my favourite commonplace book. Um, I'm allowed to have a favourite, I should think. Um, and it's a lot less glamorous than um, the other commonplace books. So this is my favourite one. Well, got it here, so you can come and have a look at it. Um, now, I've called it the Thomas Commonplace Book. I'm not 100% sure it was related to this family, but I've done quite a bit of investigation um, and I made my best guess on that. 
And the reason how I was able to do that was there's this list in there. There's nothing in there except this list of birthdays. And so I had to look through all the birthdays <laughs> and then I tried to find who in a sequence of in a family was born in that. <laughs> who could it be? And um, so and and also some of the dates around the newspaper. There's a couple of newspaper clippings in the book to try and get my right dates about that as well. So it, then I was able to date the book between 1890 and 1910 and um, also to say that the family were likely based in the north of the state. So for my analysis, I was able to say that it was created by, very likely created by Jessie um, Margaret Thomas, who was born in 1848 and died in 1933. Um, she was the daughter of a drapier, draper and um, she married a miller, John William Thomas, and she had her first child, Louise Edith. <laughs> I feel terrible saying this. She, she got married and then she had her first child three days later. Anyway, <laughs> shouldn't have put that one in there. Um, so they went on to have at least, but they stayed together. They had at least seven children together. And um, so at least each of these children, as well as some of the grandchildren, are listed on the birthday list here. So this makes me think that that's what happened. Um, Jesse's husband died in 1918 and his obituary states that he worked for the government railways for 30 years and was the station master for Penguin for several years. So, uh, I mean, the, the reason why I say this is my favourite is I just love the variety of it. I love... Um, and the fact that it was it was really used as well. So it's got recipes for quince, marmalade, Victoria sandwich, dandelion beer. It's got hints for eruptions on the nose, for curing the unpleasant effects of profuse perspiration. Um, it's got formulas, but lots of formulas for keeping the best hair. So I think she had lots of troubles with her hair. Um, for furniture polish, syrup for bee food, um, and even making cement for leather. Um, two of the highlights which I've put up here, um, which caught my eye, was there's uh, cures for the plague and for cancer. Um, and I, the plague kind of thought, oh, hang on. Um, but when I looked into it, there were plague scares in Australia around 1900, so it's not too unusual that she would have gone, well, there's no antibiotics at that time. How do I um, cure this? And so what she's actually put in here was a remedy from the 16th century German herb book, which uses... Um, uh, what does it say? One ounce of distilled honey syrup mixed with alloys, red myrrh, saffron, and 20 barley grains, and you rub that all together in a sheet of pure gold leaf. <laughs> so um, you can see why they had to add that in because you know I was going to have the gold leaf to actually cure the plague in that one. And then the cure of cancer um, is something that you would have found in papers at the time. I found other examples of this. Um, I wouldn't recommend using it, um, however, because it includes mercury, sulfur, and a little bit of molasses to make it taste a little bit better. But yeah, it probably cure cancer, but kill you at the same time. So, um, and there's also in just some little things, which just give you a glimpse into who this lady was. Um, there's a little um, quote about the women's sphere um, that she's pasted in and it's one of the few things that she's actually pasted in the book so you sort of think this meant something to her to paste it in them um, and some little quotes and bits and pieces just things that she obviously felt were quite important so um, that's in conclusion um, I just was hoping that from the, the little overview that I've been able to give you, you can see how, well, just how wonderful, wonderful resource that commonplace books are for historians and for people researching their family history. They often get dismissed as scrapbooks um, and, oh, that's just, you know, there's nothing there. And there's quite a jokes about them, you know, just being sort of like silly places for women to put um, sentimental bits and pieces in there um, and that the men were the ones who did the serious ones years ago. <laughs> But I think that there's a little bit more nuanced scholarship around commonplace books these days and that, as you can see, that they really do give you a little window into the lives of people. Um, and it did make me think, well, what are we doing now? Um, and Jasmine and I were talking before <laughs> about, well, what – should we be creating these now and having something to hand on? Should we be relying on Pinterest and Instagram and those very ephemeral items? Um, or can we perhaps have something that we can hold in our hands and write down slowly that then we can put our thoughts into and pass to our families? So I hope, if, if nothing, that this has given <laughs> a bit of an encouragement that you might go pick up a volume on the way home. It doesn't have to be fancy and just start putting something together. So thank you.
are there any questions? Um, can I ask? Um, the all course grapple. A stage further the dividing line. Um, Did you look at it? Or? I had to stop myself at one point, Marion. I was getting, I had like about five more sitting on my desk and, you know, I asked someone to, um, whether they thought I was going a bit over the top and they said, yes, it's time to stop listing the commonplace books. So, yes, there are, there are definitely some more within the Allport collection that could have been included. Um, but so I... Were mainly artwork. And that's, what, yeah, and that's... that's not the necessarily the recipes, the tips, the, you know, cures cancer. They're probably very much more on the friendship album side of things. And it was quite interesting. It's strange dividing <clears throat> lines all through those sort of semi then. Yeah, yes, very much so. I think when I was looking for friendship albums in the collections of other state libraries, I found the term was not used very often, that um, catalogers had used scrapbook, very much so. Yes. Whereas when you look um, to America, um, in their institutions, they use friendship album. Um, it's a much more common. So the scholarship on it um, that I found as well, very much the America, um, the US has done a lot around friendship albums and the place that they are. But for some reason in Australia, we're still classifying them as scrapbooks and not distinguishing between the two, or we might call them a commonplace book or a scrapbook, but we won't put that friendship album in there as well. So I think there's probably a place to nuance the, um, the description. Yeah, and the interesting fact that the, the men seem to in the Renaissance and all the rest that they seem to write. Mm. And then the women took over in Victorian. Yeah, and I was quite curious about that as to whether I did a bit of looking into when education, um, where, you know, education and wealth and when this started to be, or when people were able to have access to these kind of bound items which they were able to do, travel becoming more available so people would travel and then get people to um, add things. So I think there's definitely, um, if you get particularly interested, I have a couple of quite weighty um, scholarly papers on the topic, <laughs> which I can share with you. But um, yes, because it's, um, I think it's quite interesting to look at and that whole sort of feminist perspective as well um, and society and wealth um, and what it means to be, because some of these people in like the, the hills, the early ones, they would not have been particularly wealthy people keeping their books. Like they was a servant and a grocer and something like that. So they were really, they had to be very useful items, um, uh, but they also had to be literate as well. You'd think there would have been a revival of doing that during COVID. It's interesting that you say that we do have at least a few that were donated to us at the time. There's one which I was only able to convince the lady to allow us to digitise it. We don't normally digitise without taking the original, yeah. but it was so beautiful that I just had to do it. And she said that she'll put it to us in her will. There's absolutely beautiful one in there where she's illustrated each of her days with um, little quotes and quips and things like that. So, yeah, that was one time during COVID where we put out the call for people when they slowed down. Um, they started to put together similar type things. Yeah, I wrote this wrote a note, my 10 favourite things of everything. Mm. Oh, so I was curious to know, does, does Common Facebook also include journals for diaries, for example, that have been um, maybe um, transcribed as well? I think... To, to my way of, of, from what I've been able to read, it's really is a difference between the inner thoughts and the collection of information around you and putting it in a spot. So a journal tends to be more, these are what, this is what I'm thinking, this is what happened. And as I said with the, the lady with the magpie's curry, like she did include a little bit of her journal inside her book. So they're often very hybrid, but I think the majority of a piece is usually a commonplace book is usually taken from other places. Oh. So they've gone... I really like this poem, this lyric, this, that, um, and I'll put that in my book, whereas a journal tends to be more of the inner thoughts of someone. That's that's a distinction that I seem to have found. Yeah, and the things that have been um, published, the published commonplace books, there's one by um, the author and poet Auden that tends to come up all the time. I think it's called A Certain Place. Um, could be wrong. <laughs> anyway, that one um, is his... Um, they became very popular for authors. So authors would put their favourite little bits of a whole lot of things that they've um, read and put them together. And then if they, if others or themselves thought they were important enough, then that would get published. So it would go from a handwritten to a published. 
one that I was thinking of was the Diary of John Scott the Sealer, which is transcribed by Andrew Isdale. Um, so she transcribed it. Yeah, I know the one you mean, and that's a put as a, I think we've called it a commonplace book. I thought. Yeah, I can't remember, but anyway, yeah, and that it just shows you the nature of the hybrid nature, you know, whether it is something where you, whether it was that someone had written down someone else's accounts and put it in there, and that's why we decided to term it like that. Um, but it is a way to kind of distinguish a bit that it's from a pure journal or a diary. We do have a lot. We've got, compared to commonplace books, we have hundreds, if not a thousand diaries in our collection um, in comparison. And they also have wonderful resource. Can I ask about another Scott? There's the two brothers, Tom Scott and James Scott. Yeah. Surveyor. Can you tell me more about that book? Oh, yeah, but that one, that one's actually been digitised, so it is available online. <laughs> yeah, I believe so, yes. Um, so I can't really tell you too much off the top of my head. Um, I do know that when we got it, one of the things that we were very interested about was there was place names in there to assist in... Um, tracing the Aboriginal place names um, in Tasmania. So that was that's the main bit that I had to do in that, um, was trying to work out. Um, and that's with a lot of these things where people have put bits and pieces of information in there and you don't know whether it's them writing it from their knowledge or whether it's them transcribing it from someone else. And we often get confused now because if I wrote something and put my name at the bottom of it, nowadays we'd think, oh, she must have written that, whereas that was not... We need to take ourselves back into the context and think that if somebody wrote something um, 100, 200 years ago, um, it could be that they've copied it from somewhere else. But then they've said, oh, this is, I've added it. So that's where we try and, with those things, try and dating the entries and dating what people have done is quite difficult. But that's probably all I can tell you about that, sorry. But, yeah, you can definitely find it um, online. And I think I have that on my list that I've passed out, yeah. Years ago, I wrote a scrapbook in my opinion, it's wonderful because it's World War I, newspapers and photos of the deaths of soldiers dying, and the things, the appearance, other appearance of the wives that put in the paper. Do you know if that's been digitised or is it, you're going to have digitised or would you come in and ask for that again? Oh, there's two sort of things to that. that well, there's probably three elements to that. One is Every year we have a digitisation project uh, plan and we ask our staff and, and we have a bit of a um, group of family historians and different researchers that are on a committee and they give suggestions. And so over that period of time, um, we have a suggestion for a year of what we can dig digitise. And it, some, some of the boring elements are we have to make sure that we have a mix of things so that our poor digitisers aren't doing the same manual handling exercises over and over again. So they do maps and they do... Um, volumes and a, a, a wide variety of items. So it is very possible that if you put support a suggestion that it can get added to that list and then um, within a period of time. So that's one thing to it. Two, it could have already been digitised, I'm not sure. And three, copyright does put a spanner in the works of some of the things. World War One shouldn't be an issue because it's pre prior to 1950. Um, and also the other, when we're working out our priorities for digitisation, we do check on um, the availability. So some of those things might be available on Trove through the newspapers. And so if there is an easy other access, we might try something that there's no way you can access it anywhere else. That probably get a higher priority. But you can definitely put it forward. I've got a very old pen written in the 20s. And I remember when I was doing my PhD, are you interested in taking things like that? Yeah, we definitely are. There was, yeah, and that helps. That helps to know that because often we'll have researchers who their research is enhanced by having seven or eight of a particular type of thing to be able to do comparisons um, and knowing the family is, is definitely useful. Yeah, yeah, all of those things together is quite good. There was a period of time where recipes um, and those kind of books and commonplace books, some of them, we had lots of troubles because of copyright because they were classified as um, what's called orphan works for a long period of time and we didn't know. But there's been some changes in the copyright laws over the last few years which allowed us to put a sort of a full stop on some of those things. And recipe books were one of the big things we used in the campaign to try and get the copyright changed because it seemed very silly that um, 
you were breaking the law basically <laughs> by reproducing a recipe from a book. So um, that's, yeah. So, yes, we would be interested in that kind of thing and any other kind of commonplace books that people have as well. Just wondering, Jen, because you've mentioned it two or three times now and we've got people on the webinar, how do they um, make the suggestion? How do the public make the suggestion for something to be digitised? Well, our main contact, website? yeah, our main contact with the public is through the area, which is the um, State Library uh, well, reference service, State Library. Um, I'm looking at Clifford now because he works for oh, <laughs> State no. Library Archive Service um, and Archive Service. Yeah, and so basically through the people at the front desk, anything like that, they can always put something through and they can email it through to me yeah, and I can put it through to my colleagues. Forms, in fact, yeah. as Min says, there's feedback forms. There are feedback forms. Yeah, Anyone, any front of house avenue, you just have to articulate clearly what it is. I want this to go on the digitisation list and then they will funnel it through to us. That's the best way to do it, is just to contact the reference staff or the front of house staff in any of our libraries and then they will funnel it back. So there's no suggestion box anywhere? There, there isn't a suggestion box. We don't actually get that many suggestions so there's no real need for so but um that's not to if someone wants something and they want it straight away to be digitized then there is a fee involved and they um they get a high quality digitized item and so anything in our collections nearly anything can be digitized that way but of course that's a fee to jump through past um the queue used to be a suggestion pamphlet just a general one uh, I think it's more a feedback form now for those companies. There is suggest there's there's a suggestion online where you can suggest books that we might purchase or resources we might purchase, but um, no, um, and it it depends. We we do an analysis, and it may be if there's something that is so obscure that the only one person in the world is going to be interested in, then it may not be the highest priority. Um, but if you can put a good argument for it and it ticks all the boxes, then there's no reason why it won't, something won't be digitised. Is that sort of? Yes, yeah. yep, yep. We just thought we'd just um, pop yep, that yep. in there. I'd like to say thank you very much, Jen. So here's thank some you. chocolates from Libraries Tasmania. And thank you very much to all that have attended on the webinar and um, in the room. Uh, we do have some more talks that are coming right up until the end of August. And the next talk will be in Allport with Jane Giblin uh, discussing the Dear Kate exhibition, which has, yeah, that's basically flown off the charts with a bit of popularity at the moment, again, with another item that's come out of um, another archive, but um, and includes drawings and text. So hopefully we'll see you then. Thank you. <laughs>